Good evening, good evening to all of you. So, uh, thank you for the third edition of what we call Eureka Chat. Chat like to chat, and Eureka was an iPhone, yes. And uh, we tried to organize some uh, small uh, talk about some scientific technological topic. And we tried to uh, bring some specialists here and to make uh, a presentation about what they are doing and their field of activity and make it, uh, at least for people like me, accessible in terms of vocabulary, knowledge, and so on. And uh, that's always very interesting, so thank you for being here. I think today we have a quite significant number of guests. Yes, and so that's great, especially the topic today is water. And you see today, yes, we had a lot of water. For those who were with me this morning, especially in the boat. <laughs> we went to an island and yes, we got a lot of water. So, but we will obviously focus on something a little bit specific, not only to the rain or the water, top water we get, but also to uh, some uh, water and sanitation issue, and which is important for obviously development and uh, of the people and sustainability of the environment. So I'm glad to uh, welcome uh, Kanta Echeveri, uh, project manager at Space, based in Fiji, here. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for initiating this. <laughs> and uh, so, obviously, in France, we are quite active in that field of water, and we have big companies like Space, obviously, active in the water and sanitation. And, uh, and in France, we have a lot of also public policies, like uh, based in management, pollution, right against pollution, and now obviously adapting these policies and the practices to the uh, impact of climate change. And uh, so, obviously, we face, like many countries, the problem of water scarcity, exac exacerbated by climate change. Uh, not Fiji, actually, but anyway. Uh, so, and it's a huge incentive to uh, develop cooperation, interaction between countries and uh, to try to tackle with that kind of uh, challenge. And uh, France, obviously, as I said, is uh, very active and like to contribute and bring some solution, uh, like, for example, water recycling, efficiency practices uh, to uh, our partners. So I wish you, I wish you a very enlightening uh, session today, and uh, can bring also uh, to reflect to us to reflect a little bit about our relation with water, how we uh, spend it, or perhaps we overspend it, we waste it, and how we can contribute to a more sustainable and equitable uh, world. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And at the end of that conference, so we propose you some break, not only water, but also other drinks, and also some uh, light food. Thank you so much. I apologize in advance because today is also the National Day of Japan. So at six, I have to go to the uh, residence of my Japanese colleague uh, to uh, honor the invitation for the uh, Upper Universe Day. So that's why I will leave a little bit early. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I give the floor to Kanta. Thank you very much, Mr. Masaru. So today's topic is drop by drop the journey of water.
So my name is uh, Quentin Echeverry. I'm a civil engineer by training, and I'm a project manager at Trust Consulting by job. As uh, said by Mr. Ambassador, I've been living in Fiji for a bit more than two years ago. So the agenda of today's presentation is first, I'm going to talk to you about water on Earth as a whole. Then we'll discuss it, the specific of uh, drinking water and wastewater. So, water on Earth. I'm uh, starting with a question to you. So, we know there's a lot of water on Earth. Does anyone know how much percentage of the surface of the planet is covered by water? Does anyone have any idea? A lot? Lots. Yes, that's true. 70? <laughs> 70%? Yeah. You know your figures, that's great. 70.8%. Um, in terms of volume, do you know how much it makes? A lot. A lot also? <laughs> well, not so much. It's only 0.02% of the volume because the water is only on the surface, it's very shallow. The deepest uh, water point on Earth is uh, in the Marina Trench, it's only 10 kilometers deep. So compared to the more than 6,000 kilometers of the... Um, of the oh, sorry. Okay, so yeah, compared to 6,000 kilometers of the radius of Earth, that's very, very few. Um, this water, how is it shared? Well, 95.6% of them is in the ocean, and uh, another percent is in other saline water, and the fresh water is only 2.5% of the water. On those 2.5%, the two thirds of it are in the glaciers and the ice caps in the north and in the south poles. Um, one third of it is in groundwater, and the surface water is only 1.2% of the total water of Earth. Uh, finally, in this surface water, there's also more than two thirds that part of ground ice and permafrost. The lakes represent 20% of the rest, and uh, the rivers, uh, they are only 0.5%. Um, and then, as humans, what do we do with water? So we divide it into three main activities. The first one is agriculture. Um, we, we give to agriculture 70% of our water consumption. Then for the industry, we have 22%, and our domestic uses, so the household uses, are only 8% of it. So, drinking water. Um, what's the definition? Drinking water is the main source used by households for drinking, cooking, personal hygiene, and other domestic uses of water. Um, there is no quality definition of drinking water. When we talk about good quality water, we talk about safe drinking water. Uh, which is defined by, by water that is free from pathogens and elevated levels of toxic substances at all times. Um, are you familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? So, the SDGs, they are UN goals that the uh, UN gave themselves in 2015 uh, to achieve by 2030. There are 17 of them, and one of them is about water, that's the SDG 6, and on drinking water, to be specific, it's uh, SDG 6.1. So the goal reads that by 2030, achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. Um, so in 2000, only 61% of the population had access to a safe, safely managed drinking water service. In 2022, it reached 73%. But as you can see, there's still a long way to go before we can reach 100%. Um, this is a map showing the percentages uh, in the world. The Pacific Island countries, they appear on this map, but they're just a bit too small. Uh, <laughs> but they are part of the statistics. Uh, as you can see, there's a big uh, regional differences in those. Um, so the worst countries in terms of access to safe water are Central African Republic and Chad, with only 6% of the population. And the third is Tuvalu, with 9% of the population having access to water, to safe water. And as you can see, sorry they didn't show the Oceania region in this graph, in this, uh, yeah, in this graph, but um, it's very unequal based on which continent you are living on. It is a global health issue because unsafe water carries a lot of pathogens. Um, do you have any idea of pathogens, of diseases you can catch by drinking unsafe water? Cholera. Cholera is one of them. Any, any other ones? Typhoid fever, yes. We had an outbreak in Fiji a couple, a few months ago. Uh, so the, the most famous ones are botulism, cholera, uh, issue faculty, it comes from the feces, dysentery, uh, leptospirosis comes from uh, rodents, infection of the water, typhoid fever, hepatitis, and even polio. All those diseases you can get by drinking unsafe water. 
The WHO, they estimate that uh, 842,000 people die every year uh, due to a lack uh, of access to safe drinking water and safe sanitation. So that's a bit less than the population of Fiji dying every year just because of water. So, uh, what makes drinking water safe? Um, so, to have safe drinking water, the WHO, they define quality guidelines. So there's a huge set of parameters that are measured, and for each and every one of them, a guideline is defined by the WHO. Then on top of it, every country defines their own quality standards. Uh, most of them decide to be more stringent than WHO uh, guidelines. Um, the parameters that are measured are separated into four main categories. So the mineral parameters, then the first one is turbidity. Uh, it's, uh, so in French, it's whether or not the water is trouble, uh, whether or not the water is see-through. So a high turbidity is the water you cannot see through, a low turbidity you can see through very well. Uh, then you can have some metals in the water, nitrates and sodium. Um, then you have the organic uh, parameters. So um, the first one is natural organic matter. So let's say on a river you have a leaf falling in the river and some molecules from the leaf go in the water. That's natural organic matter pollution. Um, some of them like it and they call it tea. Um, then you also have uh, pesticides, uh, detergents, um, hydrocarbons. So these ones are mostly not natural. They come from uh, human-based pollution uh, by the use of hydrocarbons. And micropollutants. So in those, the, those are what we call the uh, emerging pollutants. Uh, they come mostly from our use of medicine. Because some of the medicine we ingest, uh, we can find it in our urine and it goes into the, into the water. Um, you have the biological uh, criteria, so bacteria, viruses, phytoplankton, and zooplankton. And then in the end, uh, we also measure the radioactivity. So I'm only talking about natural radioactivity because uh, human made radioactivity usually we have to leave the area we're not drinking the water there anymore. So all of those are followed. Um, then, so for drinking water, uh, you have four types of water that you can drink. Um, the first type is surface water, so that's water that you will take from the lakes or the rivers. The second is groundwater, so that's water that's in the aquifers in the rock below the ground or even spring when the, you have lucky enough to have the aquifer coming all the way to the surface. Uh, rainwater and the last one is seawater. So um, during this presentation I'll go in each and every one of those to discuss what the general quality of, this, of these waters and how we make it drinkable and safe for consumption. So, the first one is surface water. Um, surface water, uh, what is it? So, how, how do we uh, recognize surface water? Uh, usually there are some suspended solids or colloids. So, those are very, very small solid particles that are inside the water. They are not dissolved, they are solids and they are carried by the water. Then you have also the dissolved organic matter. So, they can be natural or artificial and often they are the ones responsible for the color of the water. So when you see the water being green or brown, this is usually caused by suspended uh, by dissolved organic matter. Sorry. Um, another thing to know about uh, surface water: uh, its algae concentration can vary a lot. So I don't know if you've ever seen some lakes being all of a sudden covered by algae being all green. This is very specific to surface water. It does not happen to uh, other kind of water. And uh, also, there's a uh, lots of uh, pathogenic sorry organisms living uh, in those waters: so viruses, bacteria, and even parasites. Um, so how, how do we make this water drinkable? Uh, I've shown here a graph with the most common stages of treatment and we'll go into each and every one of them. The first one is what we call screening to get rid of the suspended solids. Then we have a stage of coagulation, flocculation and settling to get rid of suspended solids, dissolved organic matter, algae and some pathogenic organism. Uh, then we filter this water and then it is infected before it's uh, sent to the network or to the response. So, screening, it's uh, very basic, it's a uh, mechanical stage. It's basically, you put uh, some boundaries uh, very close to each other and it will mechanically block whatever is bigger than this. Uh, it helps you get rid of branches, leaves, fishes also, because when you, have the, when you take the water from the river, you don't want to pump a fish, to bring some undesired color and taste to the water. And rubbish, unfortunately there's also a lot of rubbish in the rivers and lakes. Um, its main purpose is also to protect the later stage of the treatment. By removing everything that's too big to be treated after, you protect the rest of the plant. 
Um, coagulation. Uh, so I'm sorry this is starting to be technical, but uh, we'll go step by step. So the colloids, these are the um, solid materials that are in the water. They are unfortunately very stable in the water. Um, I hope you are familiar with uh, the notion of electrons and protons, that are the, what makes up the atoms. So basically in colloids, um, the electrons are concentrated in the outer layers of it. So it means that they have a negative electric charge. Okay? And how they act between each other, since they are all negative, they act like magnets, you know? Like magnets, when you put the same two poles together, they will repulse each other. So this way, they remain stable in the water. So how to counter this? Well, we add some material in the water that is positively charged. This way, the negatively charged will stick to it. So we call this a coagulant. Um, it will destabilize the colloids, they will agglomerate and form what we call microflux. So these are the new particles created with smaller particles sticking together with uh, coagulants. What we usually use as coagulants is iron or aluminum. In the case of Fiji, it's uh, aluminum that we use, but you can use both, they both work very well. Um, okay, now for flocculation. So once we have created those microflocks, they are still very, very tiny, so we want them to stick together, to be very bigger and heavier. So we use another kind of uh, reagent that we call uh, flocculant, it's a polymer. It works like glue. You have those little things you put in the water and you glue them together to become big things. Um, so what we can use as flocculants, um, we have some natural ones that exist. So it's uh, within the starches. Uh, in French, it's uh, amidon. So that can be found in uh, corns, potatoes, or even cassava. It can be used to make it. Otherwise, you can buy them from the plant, uh, synthetic polymers, with uh, chemistry plants. Um, the third step is settling, that's the easiest part, is once you have created those big and heavy blocks, you just let gravity do the job and they will settle at the bottom of the water. So in reality, in a plant, uh, this is how it happens. So you see here, you have the raw water coming in, it goes into the first room where it's mixed with the coagulant and you mix it very, very heavily, very, very quickly, very strongly, so that you, you are sure that all the, your colloids are destabilized and stuck with iron and iron. Then the water flows naturally through a second chamber uh, in which you will add the flocculant. You, you will add the glue to transform these flocks into bigger ones. And then water flows naturally to the settling part, so those bigger things, they will drop at the bottom when you will extract them and you get the clear water on the surface. Is it clear? Do you have any question now? Okay. Um, then after that, we have a filtration stage. So this stage is a safety stage. Basically, it's, uh, if the flocks you have created, some of them have not settled perfectly and they're still inside the water, you, we add a mechanical filter. So it's just uh, a sand bed. We put sand at the bottom, we put water on top, Water will percolate through the pan. It's just a mechanical stage, which means that there are tiny holes between the grain sands, the grain of sands. If your flock is bigger than this hole, it will not go through. It will stay in, and only the water will flow. Um, and then at the at the bottom of it, we have what we call nozzles, that are just little openings to gather the water and make sure that the, the sand stays inside the filter. So this is purely mechanical. It is bigger than the hole. It doesn't go. Through. And then uh, the last stage is disinfection. So disinfection is the fact of rendering inactive pathogenic organisms carried in the water, such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites. It does not remove them from the water, it makes them inactive and not harmful anymore. Um, so you know in terms of chemistry, so for the bacteria, it will have an impact on the membrane of the cell, making it more porous, and this way the content of the bacteria will uh, get out of the bacteria more easily, it will not be able to keep its internal content inside of the cell and will die because of this. Uh, for the, in the case of viruses, uh, it attacks its uh, DNA, uh, it modifies its DNA and makes, it makes it die because of it. Uh, as a rule of thumb, just so you know, um, viruses are harder to eliminate than bacteria. That's it for the surface water, now we will talk about Groundwater, uh, so water that you get from uh, uh, boreholes or springs. Um, 
Groundwater composition depends on the chemical position, composition of the terrain. What does it mean? Is that so? Groundwater is stored in porous rocks uh, below the earth. Okay. If this rock is full of iron, then you will have some iron in the water. If this rock is full of manganese, you will have some manganese inside the water. Um, the advantage of groundwater is that it is less sensitive to accidental pollution. Um, the meaning is that this water is deep, there are so many layers of soil between our activity even on the surface and where this water is stored that we are less uh, inclined to pollute it accidentally. Uh, however, uh, once the pollution reaches the, this water, we don't know how to take it out because it's too deep, uh, we, we, we're not going there. So this, they really need to be protected from pollution. They are naturally protected, but once the pollution happens, it's too late. Um, most of the groundwater sources satisfy portability standards. That means that the water coming from the borehole, you can drink it as is in most of the times. Um, otherwise, when it's not common, when it's not um, sorry satisfying those parameters, then usually what you what you have is dissolved metals in it. So mostly iron and manganese. So I've shown you here a typical uh, process of treating the groundwater when it contains iron and manganese. Uh, the first step will be to uh, uh, oxidize those metals because they are dissolved metals and once you oxidize them they become solid then you can filter them out of the water and then the water is drinkable, you just have to disinfect it and you can send it um, so, uh, this is chemical <laughs> so, so just, just so you know, uh, so this uh, these metals here, they are ions, uh, Fa2 plus and Mn2 plus, this means they are dissolved inside the water. And what we want is to uh, make them solid. What we have is here is Fa, OH3 and uh, MnO2. And once they become solid, they, go, they are out of the water, they will settle down and you can take them out. Uh, what I want to emphasize on those uh, equations is that uh, iron, it can react with oxygen, which is steadily available on Earth, to become solid. whereas a metal like manganese, it's harder to get rid of it because uh, the air is not enough. You have to go with uh, bigger oxidizers. So in this case, uh, it's the case of ozone, which you can add some other chemicals. And the reaction is to show that see, manganese needs to be in the water and ozone. It becomes solid and it creates uh, oxygen. And in the case of iron, so air is enough. So it's, uh, it's very easy to get rid of it. Just put it in contact with air. Um, now for the filtration, so uh, it's basically the same as the mechanical uh, filtration we've seen before, the same filter, except that uh, we will put bacteria in those filters, in the, in the filtering media, because those bacteria, we like them because they are able to produce some molecules that we call enzymes, and these bacteria, they are able to transform the dissolved metal into solid metal themselves. So basically, we just flow the water through this sand filter. This sand filter is equipped with the right bacteria to um, uh, eat the metal out of the water, and you get the water after it that's uh, free of uh, those metals. And after that, it's the same because once these bacteria have precipitated this metal, it becomes too big to go through the little holes between the, the grain of sands, and it's stuck in the filter. After that you're done, uh, you just have to disinfect the water to make it safe for consumption all the way through the pipe. Uh, but this, this is the same style as before because disinfection is the same all the time. Um, so just so you know, this, this is an example of a, a plant, an actual plant that uh, removes both iron and manganese from the water. So we start by what is easiest, that's the iron there. So we put some care inside to have it react with the oxygen and then we have those uh, special filters that we have inseminated with the right kind of bacteria that will eat the iron out of the water. And then uh, we start to tackle manganese, so we put another chemical that will help us get rid of the manganese and we go to another kind of filter that's been inseminated with the bacteria that can eat the manganese out of the water. After that, just disinfection and we send it to the network and people can drink it. That's it for groundwater. Uh, now for rainwater, uh, how do you make rainwater drinkable? You don't. Uh, rainwater is of great quality, oftentimes much better than groundwater of all surface water. Rainwater is of excellent quality. The issue with rainwater, because 
We all know some people who got sick after drinking wine water. Comes from the collection and the storage of it. So this picture is the typical system that exists in case of rainwater consumption. So what we call the catchment area is the roof. That means that we're going to collect the water that falls on this roof. There's a transportation system that's your gutter, and there's a storage that's the tank. The issue with that is that the roofs they can have human, animal, and bird feces on them. They can have mosses and lichens. They can have windblown dust. They can have uh, artificial pollution from the from the exhaust of the cars going into it, and pesticides as well. So even if the water coming from the sky is very clear, the moment it touches your roof, if your roof is not crystal clear, it becomes polluted and it becomes dangerous for consumption. Okay, that's it for rainwater. And now for seawater, um, we use a special process called reverse osmosis, and I've picked a short video to explain it to you. There's a quiz at the end. As the Earth's population continues to grow and develop, our limited freshwater resources become increasingly scarce. We are fortunate that the Earth's oceans offer an alternative and can provide a sustainable supply of potable water. Seawater can be economically and reliably converted to potable water through a process known as seawater reverse osmosis. The process starts by extracting water from the ocean using wells located on the shoreline or by using an intake structure located in the open ocean. Osmosis is a naturally occurring process where a solvent, such as water, passes through a semi-permeable barrier. The semi-permeable barrier, or membrane, allows some things to pass through it, but not others. In nature, the direction of flow through the membrane is from a less concentrated solution, such as fresh water, to a more concentrated solution, such as seawater, until equilibrium is reached. Reverse osmosis is when the opposite occurs. By pressurizing the concentrated solution, the seawater, we are able to force water molecules to pass from the salty seawater solution through the membrane to the fresh water. To protect the reverse osmosis membranes from becoming clogged by solid particles that can be suspended in the seawater, the seawater is filtered before passing through the membranes. This is accomplished by using multimedia filters, which are tanks or vessels containing a series of layered granular materials. These materials can be anthracite, garnet, sand, pebbles, and or gravel, which are assembled in layers. The filters remove sand, twigs, seaweed, and other particles from the seawater. In some cases, other types of membranes, known as ultrafiltration and microfiltration membranes, are used instead of multimedia filters to pre-treat the seawater. Next, the filtered seawater travels to the cartridge filters, which act as a second stage of filtration. Cartridge filters used for seawater reverse osmosis are typically made from a yarn-like synthetic material that is wound into cartridges. These remove even smaller solid particles from the seawater, such as fine sand and clay, before the seawater proceeds to the reverse osmosis membranes. High pressure pumps increase the pressure of the seawater up to 1,000 psi. The pressure needs to be sufficiently high to overcome the naturally occurring osmotic pressure and force water from the saltwater side through the reverse osmosis membranes to the freshwater side. The salt particles in the seawater are rejected from passing through the membrane to the freshwater side 
and remain behind on the concentrated saltwater side. The reverse osmosis membrane can be thought of as a number of sealed envelopes connected at their open ends to a tube. There are spacers between each envelope which allow water to flow across the membranes. The membrane envelopes and spacers are then wound around the tube like a roll of paper towels. The reverse osmosis membranes are then enclosed in a fiberglass shell. The membranes are connected end to end, usually six to seven membranes together, and housed in vessels that are built to withstand pressures up to 1200 PSI. As the pressurized seawater enters the pressure vessel and flows across the membrane surface, the water molecules are forced into and through the membrane envelopes, leaving the salt molecules behind. The desalted water passes through the membrane and emerges at low pressure, where it is collected in a tube and directed to one end of the pressure vessel. The concentrated salt stream that is rejected from flowing through the membrane continues to pass across the membrane surface, where it is collected separately. The concentrated salt stream retains about 55% of the total energy of the seawater stream that was originally fed to the membranes. To reduce the energy that is required to operate the reverse osmosis plant, the pressurized concentrated stream is piped into an energy recovery device. Here, up to 98% of the energy of the concentrated salt stream is transferred to an equal volume of the incoming seawater in an isobaric energy recovery device. The energy recovery device significantly reduces the plant's operating costs by recovering the concentrated salt stream energy and using it to pressurize 60% of the seawater that is fed to the membranes. The concentrated salt stream will have about a 60% higher salinity than the incoming seawater. The concentrated salt stream is sent back to the ocean through a brine disposal well, or a device known as a brine outfall. The brine outfall is situated in an area of significant ocean flow, so that the salt levels are quickly returned to equilibrium with the ocean. The location for the outfall should contain no sensitive marine ecosystems. In a properly designed brine outfall, no noticeable increase in salinity can be detected at a distance of a few meters from the discharge. The pressurized seawater leaving the energy recovery device has its pressure boosted by a small booster pump so that it is at the same pressure as the seawater leaving the high pressure pump. The boost is necessary as some pressure has been lost as the stream travels through the reverse osmosis system. Approximately 40% of the seawater that enters the system is converted to potable water during the reverse osmosis process. The potable water is further treated by adding calcium carbonate to improve the taste and bring the pH to the neutral range. Chlorine is also injected to provide disinfection properties as the water travels from the reverse osmosis plant through the distribution pipes to homes and businesses. When proper conservation of natural water resources is practiced, water reuse has been applied and a water deficit still remains. Seawater reverse osmosis can offer a sustainable alternative. With good stewardship, it can provide life-sustaining water for coastal communities. These salted water supplies, which are not susceptible to drought and other natural disasters, can provide a clean, safe, potable water supply. Okay, so what I want you to remember about uh, using seawater is that um, it's possible, we have the technology for it. However, it's a last resort solution because as you as you see in this video, it uh, emphasizes a lot of energy and energy recovery. This is the most consuming in terms of energy way of producing water. So this is a last resort thing, but for communities that don't have access to any uh, fresh water, there's no other choice. Um, the, the biggest one of these in the world is uh, in uh, Melbourne, Australia. It produces almost um, 500,000 uh, uh, 500 500, 500, 500, cubic meters every day. And uh, this kind of solution is also very adapted to Pacific Island countries. There are some programs at the moment to build them in uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu because uh, they, they, they don't have any fresh water at all. They are the atolls. Okay, just now a quick slide to present to you uh, how the water supply system works as a whole. So, at first, on the top left, you have the natural water as it rains or it's uh, from the rivers or it's from underground. 
it is being collected and then treated by an operator, and then this treated water is sent to a reservoir. Then, depending on your situation, uh, this, if you don't have any network, then the water can be captured via trucks from the reservoir to individuals with uh, tanks. Otherwise, if you have a network, the pipe will go from the reservoir directly to your taps. So this concludes uh, the drinking water part. Now we will talk about the wastewater. So what is wastewater? Wastewater is defined as water that has been used uh, and affected by domestic, industrial and commercial uses. Uh, so industrial wastewater can, can come from manufacturing operation, can come from mining, or even from cooling. So let's say you have an energy plant that you need to cool, you use water for it, it becomes wastewater. Uh, agricultural wastewater, it comes mostly from animal husbandry. And then we have the urban wastewater, that's the one we're going to discuss. So urban wastewater is composed of three kinds of water. There's what we call the grey water, it's the water coming from your sinks, bathtubs, showers, your dishwasher, cloth washer. Uh, there's the black water that's coming from your toilet flush. And there's clear water, it comes from storm water and spurious water. So storm water in some places there's no separation between the storm network and the uh, wastewater network, which means that every time it rains, all the rain goes into the sewer system. Uh, and spurious water means that uh, your underground pipe sometimes is cracked and you can have water coming inside, clear water coming inside and getting into your sewer system. Uh, so sanitation is also part of the SDGs of the UN, SDG 6.2. Uh, which, which is that by 2030 they want to achieve access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all and end open defecation um, and they want to pay special attention to the, need, to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situations so in 2015 when they started this ADG less than half percent of the population had access to a safety manager wastewater system 49% in 2022 in seven years it has improved to 75% we are still behind the, uh, the goals to reach 100% by 2030 and behind drinking water. And as you can see, it's also very equal uh, in the world with the Western Hemisphere having bigger access to sanitation. Um, so what, what is inside your wastewater? The wastewater will have uh, suspended solids. Uh, so as I told you, those are the solid, small solid particles that are carried by the water, they come from your feces. Um, you have carbon-based pollution that also comes from the feces. You have nitrogen-based solution that comes from your urine. Uh, <coughs> Phosphorus-based pollution that comes from your urine. And I was all detergents. I don't think it's relevant anymore, but back in the days, they used to put in the laundry some phosphorus because it makes the uh, whites even whiter. It was very popular, but it was a big mess in terms of uh, wastewater after. And also microorganisms uh, from, from your feces. Uh, the first question is why is wastewater pollution a problem? We could, we could say, okay, it's, it's okay, we'll just have wastewater, we'll just push it away. No, there is, there is a chemical risk. Um, so the first fact is, fact is that urban wastewater is organically degradable. What it means is that in the nature there are organisms, microorganisms, that are able to eat <coughs> the, your wastewater, to eat whatever is inside of it as a source of energy. Those organisms by doing that, they also consume oxygen. So in, if you have a place where you have an abundance of wastewater, an abundance of degrading material, it will generate an abundance of these microorganisms because they will have a lot of food, they will thrive, these bacteria, they will grow, etc. Up to a point that they can consume the entirety of the oxygen in this area. What's the result? Dead organism. This, the, so if you have, for instance, a lake that's too heavily polluted, there's no oxygen in the water anymore. The fish cannot breathe oxygen through its gills. It just dies. Also, uh, nature hates uh, vacuum. So basically, when there's no oxygen and there's no uh, living organism anymore, it's free room for other organisms to grow and thrive. And those organisms are often toxic to our environment. So as you can see in this, there's a, there is a algae bloom. And uh, the whole lake became green, and the, the water doesn't even look like water anymore. Um, another risk is the biological risk. Uh, this is a very basic schematic, but that's happening everywhere in the world. So wastewater, as I told you, it contains some harmful, harmful microorganisms. 
they will be stored here and not treated. What will happen? The water will flow in the ground and it will contaminate the water source. And then you will start drinking uh, water that's been contaminated and will cause the diseases we've discussed earlier, such as cholera, uh, typhus, all, the, all this kind of diseases. So there is both a chemical and a biological risk to not treat wastewater. Um, so we'll divide the presentation into two parts, how we treat uh, wastewater in an urban environment and then uh, autonomous rural environment. So first, the urban wastewater. This is a typical process that's being used. The first step is a screening. Well, that's the same process as we've seen in the drinking water part. Uh, then there's grit and grit removal because um, we'll see later why you have grit in the wastewater. Uh, then there's a clar clarifier, so that's just settling. This is reality as we've seen before. Uh, and then uh, the interesting part of uh, wastewater is that uh, it's, um, we use biology to treat it. We use bacteria to treat it. And then another clarifier. So step by step, the first one is the um, screening, because it's not free, so we will not find the leaves and the, and the trees, tree branches, but people flush rubbish in the toilet, people flush wipes in the toilet, people flush hygienic pads in the toilet. Uh, by the way, the, those two, they are not supposed to go in the toilet, they are supposed to be thrown away separately in the trash. Um, and so this is a protection stage, in case people still do that, to protect the later stages of the treatment. Uh, then we have a grease and grit separator. So, uh, wastewater can contain grease because when you wash your dishes, do you take out the grease and put it in the trash before you wash it, or do you just wash it in the sink? So, it ends up leading to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so, so, some of it comes from the domestic, uh, most of it comes from restaurants. But uh, in restaurants, they are supposed to be equipped with a grease trap to have the, the grease remain there and be evacuated and never reach the network. That's the legislation in Fiji. Uh, and grit, so grit, these are solid materials like uh, sand or gravel that comes inside and that come from break in the pipe. So for this, we just use gravity. Uh, I think you've all put some oil in water at some point. It floats. So we just let it float and with skimmers, we get it out of the water. And for the grit, we just let it sink and get it out of the water. We love to use gravity. It's free. Um, then we have a primary clarifier, so that's that's the same thing, but on a much much larger scale. Uh, basically, the idea is to let the water rest in one of those round tanks. Basically, this is usually what people figure when you talk about wastewater treatment plants. Uh, so this is a huge round shape, and the water will come in in the middle, settle, and everything that's solid inside it will be at the bottom of it, and then you get the clear water. Now I will talk to you about how we use bacteria to get rid of the carbon-based and nitrogen-based pollution in the wastewater. So, um, uh, as I told you that our wastewater is degradable, this is what happens in the treatment plants, but it is uh, monitored. So basically this degradable matter plus oxygen, when we use bacteria, they transform it into CO2 and more bacteria. So this way you get rid of the carbon-based pollution. It's for carbon, it's simple, now we get into the hard part, <coughs> nitrogen. Um, so nitrogen, it's a two-step process. Uh, first, there is what we call mineral nitrogen, so that's um, ammoniac. Are you familiar with ammoniac? Uh, so <coughs> this, with oxygen and bacteria, we can turn it into organic nitrogen. Organic nitrogen, that's nitrates. Uh, and then, those nitrates, with another kind of bacteria, and in the absence of oxygen, some bacteria can eat the nitrogen and transform it into gas, uh, the nitrite, sorry, and turn it into gas nitrogen. So gas nitrogen, it's uh, inert gas, it's uh, dinitrogen, it's 70% of the atmosphere, that's what we breathe, uh, it doesn't change anything for us. So, we found a way to deal with both of these pollutions in a single reactor, that we call an uh, aeration reactor, aeration tank. So basically the water, after being clarified, is flows in there and then we alternate phases when we aerate it to remove the carbon-based pollution and phases when we don't aerate it to remove the nitrogen pollution. All within the same reactor, it's just, it's time-based. Uh, we measure the quality of the water uh, all of the time and we decide when to aerate, when not to aerate. 
And then after that, the water goes. Um, so, sorry. So in this aeration system, the bacteria will transform the pollution into CO2 and uh, dihydrogen gas. And then it goes to another clarifier where once again we use the gravity to help us. Uh, all those um, dead bacteria and all the remaining uh, non-degradable matter in this, it will flow to the bottom where it can be extracted, we call this sludge, and then the clear water we get uh, from the surface. Uh, phosphorus. So most of the time, this what we've seen before is enough because uh, those bacteria they have a tendency to consume a bit of phosphorus on the way when they eat carbon and nitrogen. So most of the time they eat enough that you can just not have to treat it anymore after it's already here. In some specific cases, you still have to treat it. Maybe if you uh, the the place where you put your treated wastewater is very sensitive to phosphorus, you have to treat it. Then you use exactly the same process as treating water. You, you use a coagulant, the, the same one that you use for, uh, for sorry, drinking water, to agglomerate this phosphorus and let it settle, use gravity once again. And then disinfection, so also, so most of the times you don't have to disinfect, uh, but if your area is very sensitive, then you add a disinfection stage that works exactly like drinking water. You put the same chemical, chloride, and it will kill the virus and the bacteria. This is an example of a wastewater treatment plant from uh, Santiago de Chile. So as you can see here, the first stage is the primary clarifier. So that's where the raw water comes from. Uh, so this just settles here. Then you go to these uh, aeration tanks. So this is where you alternate aeration and non-aeration phases to get rid of carbon and nitrogen pollution. Uh, then you go to those round secondary clarifiers. Uh, in the case of Santiago de Chile, they wanted to uh, reuse the water, so they disinfected in this chloride contained tank. So this is what they put, the disinfectant in the water, and then the water is clean, it's ready to go, and they have their own network of treated water. That concludes it for the urban uh, wastewater management. Now uh, we'll show you a quick video on the autonomous uh, wastewater management that's mostly used in the rural areas. Septic systems are a common method of waste treatment that are implemented in millions of homes across the United States alone. But how do they work? This is a septic tank, which captures both solids and liquids for treatment and solids removal. Wastewater flows into the tank's primary compartment, filling up to the partition opening before flowing into the outlet, or second compartment. Both compartments will fill up to the outlet pipe, where the effluent flows from the tank to the disposal field. Incoming wastewater, or sewage, contains solids that settle at the bottom of the primary inlet compartment, with small amounts moving into the outlet compartment. Fats, oils, and greases will accumulate at the water's surface and is called scum. But, because of the baffle wall, these solids will be retained within the primary compartment. This prevents any solids from leaving the tank and flowing into the disposal field. You can see how the septic tank handles both solids and liquids. Gases generated from anaerobic digestion of wastewater solids will accumulate above the liquid, along with gases entering from the outlet pipe, coming from the disposal field. These gases fill the airspace above the water level, and by diffusion expand outward through the inlet pipe and exit the system through the home's roof fence. Treated wastewater, or effluent, exits the septic tank and flows to a distribution box, which distributes the effluent to two or more trenches. The effluent trickles over a gravel bed in the trenches and enters the pores in the soil, forming the trench bottom. Over time, the trench bottom will form a biomat, which will thicken and prevent water flow, allowing the trench to fill and the water level to be visible through an inspection port. Additional water will move upward through soil pores and provide plants with nutrients, promoting lush vegetation growth through a process called evapotranspiration. Septic tanks should be pumped every three years. The pumper will access both compartments to remove solids and liquids from both. Small amounts are always left behind, 
and are essential to help establish healthy micro and macro biotic levels. A thorough understanding of septic systems contributes to the proper design, installation, operation, and maintenance of septic systems. These are essential to protect public health, the environment, and assure the lifetime of the system. Okay, so yes, on the urban areas for autonomous treatment, we, we, we use what we call septic systems with septic tanks. The main issue of those is that often people think that the septic tank is enough and they don't build the pipe and the gravel part, which is equally important in terms of uh, pollution management, and uh, people don't empty them. Uh, they end up being full and they end up not treating anything anymore because no one wants to pay for the truck to come empty it. I have this system at my mother's house, I think it hasn't been until in the last 15 years. Um, this is just, yeah. Um, okay. okay. Uh, last, uh, I'll talk to you briefly about the effluents, so that's what comes out of the wastewater treatment plant. So there are two types, the first is the treated water. So depending on the context, you have different solutions open to you. So if you happen to have a river next to you, you can put it in the river. If you don't have a river, but then you're on the coastal area, you can push it back in the ocean. Or the third solution is to reuse it. Uh, so this is a picture of um, Bora Bora in uh, French Polynesia. They are famous there to reuse a uh, vast quantity of their wastewater because since they have no fresh water available, they use this treated wastewater as a way to uh, grow crops and uh, to uh, clean, uh, and so, it, so it, they are sold to the resorts and the hotels of the island uh, for their own domestic use, and it's much cheaper than the drinking water, because for drinking water they use desalination, which makes it very expensive. For the sludges, that are the solid parts that are taken out of the water, uh, two main solutions exist. The first one is agricultural spraying, so it's a very neutral organic matter <coughs> that can be sprayed over the fields. Uh, at the right season, obviously. And uh, the other solution, when the people don't want it to be sprayed because of uh, sensitivity to this, uh, to uh, potential diseases that are not actually in the sludges, but uh, mostly in their minds, um, we can use landfills. Uh, that's uh, so. Just you, you dry the sludges, you make it as dry as you can, and you just bury them in the landfill. That concludes my presentation. Uh, I thank you all very much for your attention and your attendance today. Um, I hope I managed to make it uh, understandable. I, I know there are some water experts in the room. I took some shortcuts to make it uh, as understandable as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Quentin, for the, this very interesting and very clear uh, presentation. <coughs> If any of you have questions, please feel free to, to ask them and I will give you the mic. Just raise your hand. Yeah. Thank you, Quentin. Um, regarding the drinking water, you presented the, all the different treatments, but you your presentation is going up to the treatment center. What about the distribution network? How do you make sure that when you open the tap, the water is still as drinkable as the one that we just exit in the water treatment? And what is the situation in Fiji? I'm not sure I've replied to the last one. <laughs> no, so for um, for this infection, uh, I didn't go into much detail, but we use uh, chlorine, and uh, the, the, the reason we use it is because uh, it stays in the water for long, as long as it's not consumed. So this way it can ensure uh, disinfection not only in the plant, but also in the reservoir, in the pipe, all the way to your uh, tap. So a safely managed network uh, ensures that you still have a small quantity of chlorine at your, in your tap water. This way this disinfection property of the water is kept. Um, so for, to, to make sure that the water remains safe, uh, we use pressure. So basically, uh, these underground pipes are pressurized, the water is pushed with a lot of pressure in it. This, this ensures that in case you have a crack, 
you don't have any pollution coming in because the pressure inside the pipeline will be enough to make sure that this is, you lose drinking water out, but at least you make sure that you don't have any pollution coming in. So the, the best way to ensure that uh, water remains safe all the way to the top is to have enough disinfectant and make sure that your network remains pressurized all the way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry, just one question regarding the desalination process, especially uh, using uh, those islands that use uh, seawater. Um, just how the, once the minerals are extracted, I have that they are pumped back into the sea. So those minerals, they kind of raise the salt levels in the sea and also increases the pH, which destroys the corals and marine lives around them. Is it so? So locally, yeah, so locally, yes, uh, the, the water that you take out of the plant is more concentrated than the, than the water around it. That's why you will always aim to have the outfall in an area where there's a lot of current to prevent any uh, salty water from staying in. But let's face it, uh, compared to the volume of the ocean, you just put a very, very small volume. So on a, on a global scale, you, scale, you don't change anything. Uh, that would be like uh, evaporation from the ocean when you just have the water coming out. You don't have any dead fish on the surface of water just because there's more salt there due to evaporation. It is a, a very good question because uh, there's always um, ecological study to be done to make sure that you don't put it anywhere because it can be harmful if you're in a region where you have no current and a very sensible uh, ecosystem in place. Otherwise, it's not an issue. Any other question? We are all from the diabetes center, from the health. Huh? One thing we observe when, especially when we are working in other countries, we are doing the disastrous season during the flood. The surface water co contaminated by the organic pollutant, the one we use in the pesticide in the farm. And on that time, during the disaster, there is no way you can. Huh? People have lack of water, whatever they are getting, they, they drink. And uh, I, I experienced one of the situations when I was working in another country. On that time, 60% of the hospital admission is the water, water bone disease. And it also contributes to the chronic kidney disease because all the pesticides during the flood, it comes to the surface water. So how we can prevent this? Uh, that's the my question in your process. So the, um, the first of part of the prevention is about uh, improving agricultural practices. So the way it's done is you are not supposed to use any pesticides when you know it's going to rain in the next two or three days, uh, because pesticides they need a certain time to be assimilated mm -hmm. uh, and not uh, being taken out of the, in the water. Um, otherwise, uh, there are some treatment methods that exist uh, to get rid of some of the pesticides. I'm thinking about uh, using activated carbons that are used as option. Basically, it's a very specific material to which uh, every organic molecule will stick to it, but it is uh, very expensive, and uh, you already need to have very, very high quality water before you start using it. So it's a last resort. Definitely, I mean, as in all pollution, the first step is to try to uh, prevent it, and it's it starts with uh, improving agricultural practices. More questions? Yes. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is not on this uh, presentation, but uh, what I'd like to understand is what is the embassy doing um, within Fiji to uh, increase the knowledge around water and sanitation? as well as one of the risks that currently Fiji faces. Fiji has a, a lot of water around here. We have abundance of water. But one of the risks that we have is the protection of our water sources. Our water sources are at risk, right? Due to increase in agricultural practices, or pollution, and uh, the lack of knowledge that people have in terms of protecting the water, water sources. So is there anything the embassy is doing in terms of increasing the knowledge of the people, of the communities, or any sort of projects that they're doing, or maybe engagement with, uh, no, uh, or probably you know, uh, taking this knowledge down to the schools to increase the knowledge of our children, so that you now they can improve uh, in terms of the understanding of water and water safety. But the most important thing is the protection of our water sources. 
is there anything that MBC is doing or is in terms of engagement with the local communities or businesses? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I can talk on behalf of the French Embassy, however, I'm working on a program here that's funded by the EU. And uh, one of the part of this program is to create a catchment management plan for the River River. Uh, so this means the global uh, management of the river as a resource. Uh, and, uh, any, so it, it covers one third of its level in terms of surface, uh, because uh, what we call catchment is all the area where uh, if a uh, rain drops falls in the area, it will go in the river and have an impact on it. So part of this uh, catchment management plan uh, implementation will uh, obviously incorporate um, meeting with the community and raising awareness on these issues all across the catchment. But, uh, this is a EU funded program implemented by the European Investment Bank. Hey, exactly. Sorry, on this point, uh, the embassy actually uh, will do uh, its actions through the European Union. So as we try to do Any other? I, I have seen. Uh, sorry, um, sorry I was just something. Also, as part of this program, there's a lot of training provided to the operators uh, to increase their knowledge on, the, on these stocks. But the training is dedicated to operators. But the uh, awareness phase is about all the uh, inhabitants of the catchment. Yes, good evening. First of all, my appreciation because that is a huge, huge subject and to condense it in such a presentation, my big respect. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, uh, I would just uh, also say uh, or uh, express uh, the importance of uh, what uh, the speaker before me said. Uh, so in rural areas to make awareness in Fiji about clean and safe water. There are very, very simple methods to do that, which we know from other countries. But it is all about this, the social um, matter, how to organize it. So what we call water user group support, it cannot go only by the government. And my question would be, it was very interesting for me to see and to understand again how much uh, CO2 uh, will be produced as emission by uh, cleansing and clearing um, uh, sewage and due to the increasing um, urban popula population, it is a big problem. Do you have figures about that? How much CO2 uh, uh, emission is contributing to the general CO2 problem? How much? I, I don't have the figures. Uh, I could find the chemical reaction uh, of transformation of the organic pollution into CO2. Um, it is uh, an issue in, inside of the wastewater systems, uh, but in terms of impact compared to other industries, it remains very small. Um, I, I don't have in head any issue, any figure of the uh, impact of the water in uh, CO2 and uh, green gases, uh, greenhouse gases emissions, but I'm pretty sure it's not at all on top of the list. Far, far behind transportation, uh, housing, uh, all the industries. But I agree that this is a question to be asked, uh, whether because we are transforming this uh, solid, uh, well, liquid and solid pollution into gas. Hi, so I'm from the disabled sector, and I know my voice is kind of loud, so one question, uh, when going to the northern area of Fiji, uh, in Manolevu, they use bowls. And uh, is there any way, like, um, just to use what they have within the environment? Because when they still store water in the bottle for one day, the next day it comes green and slimy. Is there any way, like, how they could filter their own water on what they have around them, rather than, I know this will take time for this to come up and it will start running in Fiji, but there, is there any other way where we could use some um, uh, just Fiji made products in order to filter their own water? Well, thank you for the question. Um, basically, to, to define the way to treat it, you have to go through a precise chemical analysis of the water to know what you, what you are actually trying to remove. Uh, my understanding is that you have a degradation of the water as time goes by, so that's probably microorganism growth. Uh, so there's probably no disinfection in place uh, in this borehole. Uh, so one, one first step could be to look into disinfecting the water before storing it. Once again, 
you'd have to make proper analysis to, to give you a proper answer. Uh, I give you one example <coughs> of borehole. Uh, we've done uh, one borehole in uh, not far away from Suba. It's in a uh, uh, village named Savura. And there is a river nearby. And uh, we, we made a borehole about uh, 100 meters away from the river. And we had uh, the very really nice surprise when we done, done some analysis. The water was uh, absolutely clear, which means uh, there was a lot of crowns that uh, filters naturally the water. And even with uh, bacteria, there was no bacteria on the, in, the, in the water. So basically we can say the water from the borehole was good enough to be in bottle. And maybe in this case, it's the bottle that's polluted. If the bottle is not clean enough, uh, it can have its own microorganism on it that will just wait for water to be put in and start growing. So just so you know, when you buy uh, water in uh, plastic bottles, we have a date of consumption before it. The date is not about the water, it's about the bottle. It's the, the date that the bottle will start to degrade and pollute the water. So the container is very, very important. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much for your presence, and uh, thank you for coming again. <laughs> uh, perhaps a little applause for Tom. Thank you so much. And now I invite you to share some uh, food and some, uh, some drinks. Thank you very much. <laughs>